Christianity, Denominations, and Cults. Monday, June 24th, 2019. It's a little after 10 o'clock in the morning here in Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. Thanks for stopping by The Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long on the YouTube channel. I am your host, Dave Long. Today, you'll be able to read along with me and see what I see on the screen because people are just so darn visual today. Just hearing a sermon does not really hold people's attention. So this is going to be better than closed captioning. I invite you to listen carefully to what I'm saying and judge this meditation today by the words of God found in the Bible, especially the New Testament. At times today, I am going to go off script. You'll know when I'm going to go off script because I'll screw up a lot in the narrative. Fun, huh? <laughs> so let's go. We have and I have capriciously entitled today's sermon, Your Church Sucks, and probably the pastor does too. <laughs> what an awful thing to say. What an awful thing to say about your well-meaning little religious church building <laughs> and the, pe the, the person who, who makes their living off of your offerings preaching to you for 15 minutes every Sunday, <laughs> working their little mind and fingertips to the bone. We don't do 15-minute little sermons here on The Shepherd's Voice. You're probably going to be here for an hour or two if you want to hear the full duration of this. And I don't believe in holding back any, any holds. No holds barred. Your church sucks, and probably the pastor does too. And, and I have righteous indignation at quote-unquote denominations and people who like to edit the Bible which is, you know, a good way to get to hell fast. Just be a denomination or a church pastor and edit the Bible. Leave large, huge, life-saving sections of it out. Twist and corrupt others. Make it say what you want it to say. And that's how you get a call. Not, not a Christian religion. Welcome to America, the land of cults and false Christian religions. They're on every street corner. Let's find out if the church you're going to is lying to you or if they are empowering you. Do you know if the church that you attend on Sunday and might support with your tithes and offerings, do you know if the pastor gives a damn if you go to hell or not and what they're doing to try to keep you out and, and what they're doing to keep you healthy and prosperous on this earth until you get to heaven? You know... Does the pastor give you the idea? I, I just don't care. <laughs> I do my 9 to 5 Monday through Friday and my 15 minutes on Sunday. What more do you want from me? I'm here to have little churchy religious one minute fix everything prayers with you that do nothing. But they sure do apply the little magic band-aid and make you feel better, don't they? Wouldn't it be great if we had churches today in the United States of America that were like the original New Testament churches. When, when you went to church, you expected God to move. You expected miracles. You expected supernatural healings. You expected koinonia. You expected the church to fellowship together, to commune together, to be together, to help one another out, to be united, to be the body of Christ. Like Jesus talked about in John chapter 17. That was his some of his last words before he died on the cross were, Father, I want them to be one. I have given them my spirit into them so they may all be one as we are one. <clears throat> and he's given us his glory that we all might be one and united. He said in John chapter 17, Father, the glory that you gave to me, the, fa the glory that God the Father Almighty gave to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I have given to them. And he specifically said, all believers in me. Not just a little magic 12. You know, we've, we've cordoned off the original 12 apostles and said, these people were special. And when they died, whoop, that was it. <laughs> no more miracles. You know what? That says that nowhere in the Bible. 
Nowhere in the New Testament does it say that those 12 apostles were special. Do you know Jesus picked the people he picked just partly for that reason? That everybody would see these guys are anything but special. These are lunkheads. These guys are fishermen he picked up who have no knowledge of religion at all. And the religious people, the religious people of Jesus' day, Jesus passed by when it came to picking apostles. He said, I don't think so. Can't work with these guys. He called them Pharisees. They were, you know, we've got the same problem today. Probably the last person you go to when you're in real need on planet Earth is your local pastor. You don't expect anything from them. You expect a little show on Sunday morning and a crappy one at that. You know, off-key singers, people who can't play their instruments, songs that you can't sing along with because they're out of your voice key, no hymnals anymore, you can't read, you know, the notes, and you can't, you don't know what the lyrics are, you don't know what you're trying to sing because you can't, there, there's no hymnals anymore. Well, most denominational churches, if you're Lutheran, Presbyterian, uh, Methodist, or some of the Baptists, they still do have hymnals. So you can follow along, and it counts when you're following along with God and when you're offering your praises to God. You don't go to church. You shouldn't be going to church just to watch a show, just to be in the Christian nightclub, or the Christian day club, the Christian Sunday morning club, you know, and go and sit there and watch a rock band, a Christian rock band, perform some of the latest hits on the Christian Top 20. You're not going there. It doesn't do you any good to just watch the girl and the guy, guitarists and drummers, play their little songs. Nothing is being done until you open your mouth and participate, and your heart and mind participate in praising God. Watching other people praise God does not impress God. But back to our thesis. Most denominational churches are Christian cults. And here's why. On today's The Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long. And I like to open weekly meditations with prayer. This is a free form prayer. We're going to go before the Almighty Throne of our Living God and Heavenly Father together. Just you and I. In the mighty name, above all other names, Jesus Christ, who is the Anointed One. And I hope you'll agree along with me, and uh, maybe we can get some miracles done here and get you free of sicknesses. Or, You know, the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. If you ever read your Bible, <laughs> if you go into Ephesians in the New Testament, that's the smaller book at the... At the uh, Let's see, the right hand of the Bible. <laughs> you know, the New Testament. If you go there, you'll see that it says we, we're, we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. That our opponents are, in fact, invisible demonic spirits from hell. And, you know, the Bible says that. And the Bible's true. But today's church, for all, you know, the their programs and and their man-made, thought-out-of-their-head solutions to problems of the people in their congregation, you would think that the only thing we wrestle with is flesh and blood and living human beings and principalities and powers and demons, if Christians even know what those are anymore, you know, fallen angels that are invisible who want you to die and go to hell, and as soon as possible, if, if those people, you know... If, if we only understood that there's an invisible warfare going on and when you're born on this planet you're in it like it or not we are not here wrestling against our problem is not our mother or father or daughter or brother or sister or son or friends or the local church pastor our problem is the devil and his contingency of the fallen demons of hell that someday will all be thrown into the lake of fire 
but for some unknown reason to me, are allowed to roam this planet today. You know, if I was God the Father, and I'm sure you've thought this many times, I certainly wouldn't have put the devil or allowed him to go into the Garden of Eden in the beginning and tempt Eve in the first place. We wouldn't have this mess that we have today. Okay, well, I'm going to create a perfect garden and a perfect life for a guy named Adam and a wife named Eve. And then I'm going to put a rattlesnake right outside their gates who's going to come in there and sit in the center and tempt them to do the very thing I told them not to do. And he's going to succeed. And all of creation and mankind are going to be under the law of sin and death. And Satan will reign on the planet then until we redeem it from the curse of the law. Gee, doesn't that sound like a great plan and a fun thing? But you know what? <clears throat> That's the scripture. That's what's going on, people. I didn't write the Bible. I'm not God. It's not my plan. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger, boy. You want to know what's going on in that respect? Read Genesis for yourself. Never read Genesis? Come on. Get in there and see what it says. This is not a little pretty mythical book. This is not a collection of stories. This is not allegories or metaphors or similes. The Bible is truth. It is the Word of God. The Bible is probably the only book in the entire universe that ever was that is true. You know, people try to say truth and, and write books that are true and self-help books and, you know, the non-fiction books on this planet and report as closely as they can. But you and I both know that human beings are limited. We're limited in our research, in our abilities, in our understanding, in our talents. You know, there was a time we didn't know about electricity. There was a time we didn't know about nuclear power. There was a time we didn't know about quantum mechanics and physics. And that wasn't a whole long time ago. And you know what? We're still innocent little beings that still don't know a whole lot about a whole lot of anything. And if you don't believe me, tell, you know, walk up to a doctor, a licensed medical doctor, maybe a specialist, and ask them, can you, on your own, in your own laboratory, in your own office, in your practice area, can you build a human being from scratch without any help? You're not allowed to use a man and a woman and take the sperm and the egg and generate a baby. Anybody can do that. But really, we don't know what's going on there. And still, there's a lot of stuff, quote unquote, air quotes, modern medical science still can't do anything about, doesn't know what's going on, don't know how it operates, and one little funny pill doesn't cure everything. And that, you know, we're still primitive. Modern medical science, they might as well call it primitive practice. <laughs> primitive physical practice. You know, we're doing the best we can here. and uh, But don't look to us for anything really supernatural. <laughs> Good luck on that one. Okay. By our definition, the definition of the Shepherd's Voice Ministry with Dave Long on YouTube channel, the Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long, which you can Google and find our channel there and listen to everything we're printing. By our definition, Christianity, true Christianity, real Christianity, biblical New Testament Christianity, which is the only Christianity there is, is the true faith of and in the Lord Jesus Christ, whose recorded letter of love to the church is contained, untainted, in what we all call the Bible. The Holy Christian Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. It is the written document of the incarnate second part of the Trinity, Jesus, who is the Christ, which is Greek for anointed one. Jesus Christ by biblical scripture is the Word of God, as defined in John chapter 1. As the incarnate breath of the living Lord God, the Heavenly Father, God Almighty, Jesus is the spoken word of the living God, the embodied word of God Almighty. When God speaks, Jesus comes out of his mouth because Jesus is the word of God. 
Now, I have been criticized in the past and by myself for speaking too quickly. And I apologize for that because it is much easier to take in deep Christian truths and the Word of God if I go a little slower, talk a little lower, stay in my low range of energy, and relax and we'll have fun here, and maybe you can learn something. It's the incarnate breath of the living Lord God Almighty, as evidenced by the New Testament, the Heavenly Father, God Almighty. Jesus is the spoken word of the living God. He is the incarnate word of God, the embodied word of God Almighty. When God the Father speaks, Jesus comes out of his mouth. Denominations are Christian faiths. Okay, now we're going to tackle this, this thing of what's the definition of a denomination? Now you know there's Christian denominations and if you quickly capriciously go to Wikipedia uh, you'll find that, that roughly you know just to chop off a point of definition of denomination there is at least roughly 3,000 denominations of Christianity of Jesus born again spirit filled Jesus is Lord and King Christian denominations there are at least 3,000 of them and if you nitpick and you talk about the different sects and types of those denominations in each given country around the world some people put that number much higher but denominations for our purposes are Christian faith the expressions of Christian faith in a religious format uh, based around the Holy Bible and there's 3,000 of them at least that exist on this planet and different interpretations of the Holy Scripture the Word of God each different in their practice in their own way to a lesser or greater degree to part from the written Word of God in the teaching of their beliefs from pulpits and ministers and seminaries and Bible colleges now you may say gee Dave they're just different denominations they're not different faiths well if they're doing things differently and preaching differently which obviously they are or they'd be one faith they wouldn't be many many denominations you could you could combine the the, the Baptists with the Assembly of God with the Lutherans with the Catholic Church but you know and I know that these religious Christian denominations are so different you'd more likely get fist fights <laughs> on the floor of any conventions of a, such a combination of these guys because these people are passionate in their distinctly different beliefs of the New Testament and Christianity and what Jesus said to the church some of these faiths air quotes again deny great portions of the New Testament such denominations cannot by definition be considered to be Christians they're cults they're not Christian if you're going to take a New Testament passage and cut it out of the Bible and ignore it and preach against it or preach falsely about it or corrupt it you've departed from being a Christian denomination you are now a cult you are a denominational cult and you cannot by definition be considered to be Christian they are so far into denial of the written Word of God that they have departed from the faith of Christianity and they lead millions of their followers and members and believers and congregants and their pastors and it starts in their seminaries and or Bible colleges they lead their people into error into blasphemy into apost apostasy they cause people to stop believing they teach people wrong things they trample the Word of God and the words of Jesus say that he said things he never said and ignore things that he did say and thus blaspheme Jesus and the Holy Spirit the members of these denominations love their church they love their religion more than they love Jesus Christ the truth the Bible the Word of God and real Christianity how do I know about this? 
my my own mother, uh, a Lutheran by faith, married to a Lutheran pastor. My father, a doctoral a Ph.D. Christian Lutheran evangelical Lutheran pastor, not to be confused with the the uh, what is it more Missouri Synod Lutheran Church or the Wisconsin. Uh, Lutheran Church or the American Lutheran Church and the uh, any of the other denominations of the Lutheran Church she loved her Lutheran churches she loved the exact liturgy and the ceremony of the Sunday morning ritual she loved the 10 and 20 minute sermons she loved the pipe organs and the choirs and and all the uh, robes and gowns that the choirs wore and and that the pastors wear you know in the Lutheran Church they they wear uh, c- kind of a dress like looking white thing with these braided uh, uh, you know emblemed things that go around their neck that go down below their waist and you know it's kind of close to uh, the Catholic Church the Lutheran Church is a lot like the Catholic Church in pomp and ceremony and the, the dress and then you go to the other side. You're not your typical non-denominational church. Well, you got it looks like some homeless slob <laughs> grabbed the microphone and went onto the stage and sat in a bar stool. You got this guy, middle-aged guy, sitting on a bar stool, up on stage with a microphone. Who's the senior pastor of the church? And he's got some ratty old shirt that's untucked and hanging out, and a pair of jeans. And he's trying to be as hip and contemporary as possible and to keep up with the, you know, with the rock band Christian group that quote-unquote leads worship or basically performs modern Christian rock songs for the benefit of the enjoyment of the people out in the denominational, out in that church. And you, you I've seen this in... Well, not only non-denominational, we're talking the Assembly of God is pretty strong on that kind of a church service also. You know, you got your 30-minute performance by the Christian rock band doing the latest Christian Top 20 songs. And then you go into a dusty sermon that does a paleontological or archaeological dig on sections of the Old Testament, infinitum to boredom. Uh, you know, no, no life, no, no spirit in the sermon. Just uh, what they could dig up from their, from their resources, <laughs> from their Bible dictionaries and Bible encyclopedias, and then you'll hear a history of, oh, it was Roman customs back then, and they did this or that, and Shakespeare commented on, commented on this, and in the Civil War there was a general whose favorite verse of scripture was and oh here's a little anecdote you'll all find funny it is a common you know I, I've had it with those churches and those messages and that that imitation Christianity I, I want the real thing I want to go to church and worship and praise God I want to be led by somebody who cares about worshiping and praising God I want to be able to sing along I want them to have four part harmonies so that one of those four parts I can sing along with. And and then I want a real sermon that uplifts me and exhorts me and tells me how God's on my side and raises my faith and, and, and sparks miracles in my life. I want to worship God when I go to church. I want to hear an uplifting, exhorting sermon that contacts and connects with me today and addresses supernaturally problems in my life. I don't want to be referred to secular agencies or governments or secular programs in order to deal with my problems that should be being handled by the church, the senior pastor, and handled by supernatural work of God, the Holy Spirit, in the lives of the believers. Anyway, my mother uh, was raised a Lutheran. Her father was a very staunch uh, Lutheran member. My fa- my my uh, earthly f- my father was a very staunch Lutheran pastor, 
and my mother's father was a very staunch Lutheran. And uh, so they were staunch people. Staunch, staunch, staunch. <laughs> and uh, what I'm saying is she fell in love with the show, the formula, the liturgy. I mean, I suppose her. I, I'm guessing and judging that her religion and her seeking of God was all she knew and was was as real as she could understand and walk in the light of what was revealed to her you know but the danger is falling in love with and making an idol out of your denomination or sect and especially if it is a corrupted image of the ris true risen savior you don't want to fall into loving your denomination or your local church and your local religion more than you love Jesus or the truth or real Christianity. You got to pay attention to the mission, the words, the will, and the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And line that up to your local church and your pastor. Line that up to your denomination, whether it's uh, Episc Episcopal, uh, whether it's uh, Oh, you know, Moravian. Up here in the Northeast, we mainly have old 500-year-old mainline denominations. We're not a whole lot of uh, independent non-denominationals. And uh, there, there are uh, Assembly of God and Pentecostal churches in our communities in the Northeastern United States, but it's not nearly as strong as, and especially the Baptists. Uh, the Baptist church is really strong in the Southeastern United States. And, of course, you go to Utah, you've got Mormons out there. And uh, uh, I won't get into that or uh, begin talking about that. But what I mean is you've got uh, strongholds in different parts of this country of uh, different denominations and different faiths and beliefs. Of course, uh, California in, in its history, in ancient California history, was kind of settled and founded by the uh, Catholic Church. Uh, thus, you've got all those Spanish names, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and a lot of derivatives from things that were started by the Catholic Church in that state. <clears throat> Let's see, down in Louisiana, who, which was uh, first uh, settled, by, I believe, you know, before the Indians, after the, the Native Americans were there, and the Indians, American Indians, then you had the uh, French coming in there. And, of course, the uh, country of France sold in the Louisiana Purchase uh, their territory in the United States to the United States government for an unbelievably small amount of money in today's terms of governments and land. But uh, uh, so, you know, the strongholds in the Louisiana area were first with the Catholic Church because most of France is Catholic. And, uh, you know, just like uh, you go to Germany, most of Germany is is uh, Lutheran because uh, it was the state religion up until a certain year. And we won't go into that history. More to say there in a future basis. But uh, as such as a denomination corrupts the Word of God, the New Testament, the Bible, and leaves passages out or adds traditions of man to it, you've left the faith. They're no longer Christian denominations. They are cults. They follow a false, unbiblical Savior and God. And some of these members of these cults would rather die than to give up their wicked, twisted, evil, alien, demonic, New Age, Wiccan, witchcraft, wizardry, beliefs, and practices. You say, oh, Dave, you say that like the New Age is a bad thing. <laughs> well, that's a whole sermon in itself, to tell you the truth. Uh, the New Age is a bad thing. It's uh, kind of like satanic light. Or, you know, Satan worshiping is falling out of favor <laughs> with mainline sane people. So, you know, the devil has repackaged Satan worship into something called New Age, which really is derivations of a lot of stuff from the Hindu faith and the Buddhist faith. And they've 
gotten into the church. You'll, you'll hear these ridiculous, just out of seminary pastors standing up in pulpits, talking about stuff you know is straight from their Pilates class or their yoga class. I'm surprised they don't say namaste when they first come into the church pulpit. You know, get up into the pulpit and say to the congregation, namaste. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, that's Hindu stuff. You know, new age. Hey, you, you know, even if you're into martial arts, there's a temptation. There. They have their own beliefs. They have their own religious uh, roots. In, in, uh, I, I know. I uh, took martial arts when I was younger, and I know martial arts has roots in uh, Eastern Asian religions in China and Japan. So, you know, don't tell me that this stuff is not dangerous. You know, your little innocent wife going to her Pilates and yoga classes at the local gym mornings through the week when you go to work or vice versa, you know, you going to the gym and working out, uh, in a Pilates or yoga class and listening to these far eastern religion uh, uh, nuts and you know these Hindu and Buddhist uh, derivatives which we've all amalgamated into a term called new age today you, know, you get out your crystals and ring your little bells light some incense and and light some colored candles a lot of this stuff comes right out of the Wiccan religion or you know what we call witchcraft and what the Bible calls uh, you're going to die and go to hell and live in the lake of fire forever religions <laughs> if it's not Jesus Christ and the Bible and it's not in the Bible and if God didn't sanctify it it's not Christian and you're not going to heaven period that's what Jesus said Jesus said I am the way I am the truth I am the light he who gets in by any other way but me, I'm the door. If you don't enter the kingdom of heaven and the spirit realm through me, you're a liar, a thief, and a robber, and you're going to the lake of fire. I didn't write the Bible. I am not the Lord Jesus Christ who came to earth and, and died and rose again from the dead 2,000 years ago. But I am part of his body, and I am united in one and in and with him. And if you are a real Christian, you are too. The Spirit of God lives inside of you. You are a temple of the living God. And you are one with the Lord Jesus Christ. Which, by the way, is why Paul the Apostle said, don't go join yourself to a prostitute or a whore because you're joining Jesus Christ to a prostitute or a whore. You don't recognize that. You don't recognize that as part of the New Testament letters of the Apostle Paul. Pick up the New Testament. You might enjoy it sometime. <laughs> Real question is, where is the line? Where is the true departure from the Christian faith, from the body of Christ, from the kingdom come to earth, on planet earth, from God the Father through Jesus Christ? Where is the line with the teachings and the word of the living Lord Jesus Christ? Where have denominations and their teachings crossed to the point where they are so far removed in their seminary teaching and pulpit pundit ministry that they can no longer, by strict definition, be called Christian and part of the faith of those of the body who are going to heaven when they cross over? Well, we know that Jesus said, those who believe on him and his message are saved, and those who do not believe on him and his name and his message are condemned. Are going to hell deal with it it's the New Testament Jesus said it it's right in the Gospels if you don't believe that you might as well throw your Bible away stop going to church and stop tithing or giving offerings anymore to your local church because you're wasting your time and money those who believe on him and his message are saved those who do not believe on him and his name and message are condemned and going to hell and be your eternal residence in the lake of fire, as defined by Jesus Christ in the Gospels and in the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. Oh, well, you know, Dave, we don't read Revelation. That's just a mystical, metaphorical book that no one can really understand. It's such, oh, give me a break. <laughs> you can read it. I can read it. It's pretty plain what's printed there 
we know God doesn't lie. We know his word is true. We know that if Jesus was here in this room today and he said, my, what a wonderful Tuesday this is, and we know it's Monday morning, well, all of a sudden, because Jesus said that, it would be Tuesday. It's not a matter of mere belief. Faith exhibits works outside of mere mental assent to the truth. Those who do the word of God and live by the commands of Jesus are sheep. Those who do not do the word of God and do not live by his commands are goats. Sheep enter into the kingdom of heaven. Goats enter into the kingdom of hell. Their residency forever is going to be in the lake of fire along with death who is referred to in Revelation as a spirit. Death was nothing invented by God. Death is a demonic spirit invented and strewn upon us by the devil. The false prophet and the Antichrist and the devil are also going to go into the lake of fire. Also called the beast in Revelation, the Antichrist is a man who has not yet come and has not arrived on planet Earth, but he will be here one of these days and he will be the epitome of the devil on this planet and against God and everything that God the Father and the Son stand for and he and the false prophet and the devil and the spirit of death those beings are going to be gathered up and thrown alive into the lake of fire forever and tortured forever and ever and ever so any churches wherein the official doctrine of their faith, of their body, the denomination corrupts or removes any of the above teaching of Jesus Christ in any way, shape, or form, they are not churches. They are not Christians. They have left the faith. Or an upscale word wealth way to say that is, they are apostatized. They are in denial of the true faith found in the New Testament. They are in error. They are <clears throat> in known or unknown error. They are not Christian denominations. They are a cult. So if you go to your local church body and your pastor starts saying any of the above, above stuff is not true or anything's true that's not found in the Bible and doesn't line up with it, you're in a cult. You're not in a Christian denomination. You are a false member, the body of Christ. You are a religion that is not teaching Christianity and the Word of God. If you don't teach the Bible and what's found in the Word of God in the Old and New Testament, you're a cult. You are not a denomination of the Christian church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's plenty of blame to go around. There's lots of denominations that chop out huge passages of the Word of God. Some denominations chop out the Old Testament, say, that's dead and gone. We don't have to read that or listen to anything in the Old Testament anymore. That passed away when Jesus was crucified and rose again. That was the purpose. We crucified the Word, the Old Covenant. Well, Jesus said, what did he have to say about that? Jesus said, until heaven and earth, until earth passes away and is no more, and the stars you see in the sky are collapsed and folded up, not a jot or a tittle of the word of God in the Old Testament passes away or is not in effect or destroyed. False members of the body of Christ religions that do not teach Christianity. It is a gray area. It's difficult for mere men to point out a black and white crossing over of the faith into apostasy and error. If denial of the power of modern day miracles is apostasy and denying the faith and denying the truth of the word of God, especially as found in the New Testament, the Gospels, and the letters of the Apostle Paul, then many, many of our denominations, popular, large, well-attended memberships qualify as cults, not true Christian denominations. Lutherans, the Assembly of God, Methodists, and the Baptists, to name a few, 
are just some of the denominations that deny parts of the New Testament as the untainted truth and the word of the living God, either by not mentioning what's in there or by adding to what is in there and saying that things are true that are not. Lutherans say, well, the day of miracles is over. When the last apostle died, that was it. No more miracles. That was just an age of signs and wonders to give a flashbang introduction and validation to the church. Wrong. So Lutherans, you could say, strictly speaking, is not a true Christian denomination because Lutherans don't believe in the Bible, in the New Testament, and what it has to say. They don't believe in the full great commission of the church. Go into all the world. Preach the good news and the gospel to all the nations. And as you go, heal the sick. Let's, under, let's put in the understood personal pronoun there in that just to emphasize what Jesus' meaning is. You heal the sick. You raise the dead. You cleanse the lepers. You cast the demons out of the people that you encounter. And that was a command. That was an order from God Almighty, the second part of the Trinity. That wasn't a suggestion. Oh, it would be nice if you're going to a foreign country or in this country to preach the gospel to somebody who is not a believer. Once in a while, if you feel led, if you know, you've had your McDonald's cheeseburger and all the stars are aligned just right, you can, you can maybe ask the person if you want to do a little churchy, religious, one-minute prayer with them so that they might feel better and be healed and be lovey-dovey and never swear again and not raise their voice and just, you know, get along as the devil is re- stealing, killing, and destroying out of your life and everyone around your lives. Just, you know, smile, you know, be there in the passive camp of everybody loves you from the New Age religion and the Hindus and the Wiccan religion, straight from the Wiccan religion, straight from their slogan and motto, uh, do no harm to no one, no matter what, uh, anything is permissible as long as you're not hurting other people. Guess what? That's satanic. That's straight from Wiccan and witchcraft religions. That has nothing to do with the Bible or God. So, okay, the Assembly of God. You said, well, the Assembly of God has it together, Dave. After all, they sit together and watch their Christian rock band for half an hour on Sundays, and then they preach their dry, dry, dusty sermon for 45 minutes, and and then they have a two-minute prayer, and they take a huge offering, and they take a huge amount of time to take the offering, and they tell you why God will bless you and make you rich if you give in to their offering. (laughs) The Assembly of God. Where are you going to roast them, Dave, after all? Don't they believe in miracles? Well, they say they do, you know, but just go into a church and hit the senior pastor there with a prayer request that requires supernatural power and see how many caveats and buts and maybes and this and that's and maybe God says yes, maybe God says no, maybe God says maybe, maybe God says wait. Just see in how many ways the senior pastor at your local Assembly of God Church crucifies the New Testament crucifies the Word of God, obliterates, changes, and corrupts. Do you, do you know that Wiccan means to twist? That's where we get the word wicker from, for wicker furniture. It means twisted, and, and to twist or corrupt something is to, uh, you know, that's where the words for Wiccan comes from. Anyways, Assembly of God. Okay, yeah, yeah in name, they used to, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they used to be a powerhouse for miracles and believing in that. But, you know, they were tired of being considered flakes and people staying away from them because they were mocked and humiliated by the Lutherans and the Moravians and the Dutch Reformed Church and the Catholics and what other church denominations do you have in your town that you grew up in who mocked the little shack of the Assembly of God Church on the corner in the bad part of town, you know as opposed to the large multi-million dollar cathedrals that the mainline denominations have built in all the little towns. I mean, in my father's church, I think the pipe organ that's in my father's church, 
alone, just the pipe organ instrument, not knocking it. I loved it, and I think it's great. And if you your church can afford a real pipe organ, go for it. There is nothing that beats your walls shaking when those bass and lower pipes open up. And and when that thing really sings, it's it's awesome. But that pipe organ cost them or would cost them to replace about a million dollars. And they take months to manufacture at the plants around the world and then install by hand at the churches. I know they just renovated the church that was at my dad's church. Uh, the, the pipe organ that was at my father's church was renovated in the 1970s. And it cost them to renovate, to, you know, just go over it, add a couple of features, redo what's there. It cost them $250,000 in 1978 to renovate that pipe organ. So there's an awful lot of money tied up into these two and 300 year old buildings in all your local towns. A lot of money. And, uh, you know, uh, the Assembly of God and their churches kind of initiated about 100 years ago. And they didn't have the old line, rich, uh, established people in town on their side. They, they were the upstart. They didn't have a lot of money. They built little wooden church buildings. They did what they could with musical instruments. Sometimes it was just the pastor standing up there wailing away on his acoustic guitar. Sometimes... You know, there's a couple of tambourines in the audience. And then they started buying pianos. And eventually they got electronic uh, organs. And uh, nothing wrong with electronic organs, you know. As many instruments as you can add to glorify God in your church, great. But the Assembly of God is far different today from what was in the mid-1980s. Just that far back. I mean, when they didn't hesitate to cast demons out in the middle of church service, people got their eyes back. They got their their vision and hearing back in the middle of a church service, in Assembly of God churches in the 1980s. And, you know, the old geezers, pastors and professors in the Assembly of God, wow, boy, do they have war stories to tell you about stuff unseen and unheard and stuff that happened inside their churches no more those days are gone you go to an assembly of god church today and you ask the senior pastor there for a miracle from god and he'll say well let's pray with you brother and see what god has to say and you know maybe he'll say yes and maybe he'll say wait or maybe or or no and, you know, if it doesn't happen, it's not my fault. It's God's fault because that's him saying no. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll preach. The, I'll pray this little one or two minute prayer here. That'll, that'll really have the devil shaking with horror and fear. Huh? Come up with your little pathetic one or two minute. Well, praise the Lord, brother. Remember to keep on smiling and don't cuss anybody out in, in your time of being stolen, killed and destroyed from the, Satan's kingdom. And I know the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against the principalities of hell the demonic evil and visible spirits that have plotted against you to take everything you've got to make you poor to wipe you off the face of the earth to give you ever sickness no- made and known to mankind to kill your pets and your children to make your life a living hell to destroy your marriage well brother just praise god and remember forgive you know while you're while you're going through hell, we're with you. We're praying for you. Stop. Don't don't say that. Senior pastor of the local church, don't you dare ever again say to somebody, we're praying for you. You're not. As soon as you left that building, your heart's on the pizza that your family's going to order after the church service. And you can't wait to get home, kick back, and watch Sunday afternoon football. Right? Maybe have a couple of beers. Nothing wrong with that. You know what? I was raised a Lutheran. Uh, Martin Luther had a brewery at his in his house. He used hops and everything. You know what? If you didn't drink beer back in the 1500s, you died. Beer or wine. Because the water in those towns, they didn't know anything about adding chlorine or digging deep wells 
or not pooping in the water that you drank from. They had cows wading through their water sources and streams. If you didn't put something in that water back up until about 100 years ago to keep you from dying, you were going to get sick. So, you know, all those people, I'll bless God, I don't drink alcohol. My parents have never drank alcohol. We don't drink beer. And give us our gold star and our wing on our house in heaven because we did not do alcohol. <laughs> now, the Bible does talk about overdoing, you know, and overdoing. And uh, it equates over, do you know the Bible equates overeating and gluttony right there with overconsumption of alcohol? Never in the New Testament or the Old Testament does it say don't drink alcohol. What the Bible says in the Word of God is don't get drunk. Don't, don't drink so much alcohol and so much of that beverage that you lose control over your inhibitions, that you lose you know, your your way of judging properly and, and handling yourself in a Christian manner. I love I love good beer, one or two, or a glass of wine. My parents did too. They're good Christians, wonderful Christians, but you know they'd have a glass of wine at Sunday dinner. It was a very elegant thing and, and uh wow, you know, the doctors are just can't say enough about how much red wine does because of the resveratrol in the wine, in red wine. And no, uh, drinking grape juice doesn't do the same thing. They were talking about red wine. How much good red wine does in your diet? One or two glasses, not a bottle. <laughs> you can't break out the vodka and drink the fifth and say, well, Dave says it's okay for me to drink this. No, that's getting drunk. I mean, I know a, a Christian Lutheran pastor uh a Lutheran pastor with a doctorate who's ordained and she used to drink a fifth of whiskey or a fifth of something a day. I mean, she was just trying to self-medicate over a, a lousy childhood, a restricted, nasty, Nazi type of German Lutheran childhood. But uh, we're not talking that, okay? You know, there's different. there's the road... And then there's the right ditch on the road, and there's the left ditch on the road. The right ditch on the road is don't drink any alcohol at all. We all know that alcohol sends you to hell, and it's evil. And anybody who touches alcohol, I certainly won't touch them. And then the left ditch on the road on the way is, well, bless God, we can do anything we want. Nobody's going to tell me I can't sit down with a fifth of whiskey and down it on a Sunday afternoon. I work hard all week, and if I want to get loaded on a Saturday night, that's my business and stay out of my life, Pastor. Okay, see see what I'm trying to say here. Ah, you know, but the Assembly of God, okay, Dave, wh where do you call them a cult? Okay, when they start telling you, you can't drink any beer. If you drink beer, you're evil and you're going to hell, and you're not of God. Wrong. <laughs> That's not scriptural. That's something added to the New Testament by the Assembly of God, mostly by the wives and widows of men who drank too much, who refused to go to church with them on Sunday mornings. And the wives would come into the church and complain to the pastors about their damned going to hell, no good husbands who got drunk last night, and you know, or whatever happened, and uh, alcoholics. So... The traditions of men entering in makes your denomination a cult. And and if you're afraid or embarrassed to pray for people for the supernatural, and at least give the shot of the possibility of the person to get a miracle from God. If you're embarrassed to try that, because if you fail, then you're not gonna look good before your congregation. You're you're denying the gifts of the Spirit of God. And I know it's all about the fruit now, Darius, because fruit's easy. It's easy to imitate fruit. It's easy to look like you have the fruit. You know, oh, I'm a loving person. I never raise my voice. I never swear. I never drop the F-bomb. And, and so that way, you know, I have the fruit of the Spirit of love. Well, you know, if your neighbor next door is in dire need, and you're rich and have more than you need, and you don't help them out, 
you don't know what love is. You're not practicing the love of Jesus. Because he said, if I was thirsty, give me something to drink. If I'm hungry, give me something to eat. If you have more than enough and have two coats, and I'm cold and I don't have any coats, give one of your coats to those people. You know the goats and sheep? Jesus, God incarnate, New Testament. said, the goats are those who, when I was in need, they turned their back on me. They didn't lend me the money. They didn't give me something to drink. They didn't give me food to eat. They didn't give me a place to live. They didn't give me any clothing for my back. They didn't try to heal me when I was sick. They didn't come and visit me when I was lonely. To the extent that you depart and you do those things which Jesus told you not to do and don't do those things which he commanded you to do, you're a cult. You're, you're a religion. You're a false Christianity. And in, to the degree that your denomination enables somebody to live that life of, well, bless God, you know, if somebody doesn't get out of bed in the morning and take care of themselves and work and get their own money, bless God, that's how me and my parents did it. And we made our own and we pulled ourselves up. It wasn't easy for us. We walked six miles each way to school uphill. We walked to school uphill and we walked back home uphill every day in three feet of snow in 40 below zero and wintry winds that's right we lived at the north pole <laughs> you know how it is you know it's a christianity tradition uh religionity it's a christian religion tradition that has nothing to do with what jesus said in the new testament well, you know, if you just hand out money to all these people, these lazy bums who don't have jobs, they're never going to get a job. They're just going to sit on their big old fat asses. <laughs> really? <clears throat> have you ever walked in their shoes? Do you know what they want? Do you know anybody who doesn't want success or to be fulfilled or in the walk of the vision Christ has given them? Uh, shame on you. At least pray with them over it. Don't you ever again criticize homeless people or poor people or people out in the street and, and you know, tell them and think that people who are rich are good just because they're rich and people who are poor are good just because they're bad or evil just because they're poor. That's not Christianity. That's the opposite of Christianity. That is antichrist. You're not a denomination of Christianity. You are a cult. But, uh, you know, the Assembly of God gives lip service to helping out the poor. Well, so do the Lutherans. Yes, bless God, there are those less fortunate than us. And we should always be mindful of the poor. And we are here for you whenever you need help as a church. Just call the local senior pastor Monday through Friday from 9 to 4 o'clock. Office hours pending if I'm not busy. And put it on my voicemail. Oh, you don't have a phone? <laughs> Well, gee, that's tough darts because you can't reach me at, in person. I don't give out my address where my house is. And and obviously, if you're too poor to have a phone, you don't have a computer or internet service. So, oh, well. <clears throat> okay, I've been picking on uh, typically. I'm not picking on specifically the Assembly of God. But there are areas. You go in there and you wince nowadays because used to go in there with a problem and the senior pastor let's see how many years ago was that it was already 35 years ago that where i'm remembering this the senior pastor would say hit and take a knee let's go up to the front let's go on the steps of the sanctuary leading up to the altar and go before god and bow our heads and vocally open our mouths and and pray pray in english pray in the spirit maybe do a little singing in the spirit or worship and praise god and intercede till we press through travailing prayer until we feel that this burden has lifted and god has answered your prayer supernaturally huh. good luck finding an assembly of god pastor to do that for you nowadays and the non-denominationals are worse you know good luck on that one they are not going to take over a minute or two with you. I, I remember well, 35 years ago. This is almost 2020. Then you go to 2015, 
2005, 1995, 1985, 35 years ago. You know, those pastors, bless God, you saw miracles in those churches. They'd hit their knees as soon as the words were out of your mouth. Uh, Pastor, I have a need. I need help. I have a financial need. I have a, a healing need. I have a, a problem child need. I have a missing persons need. I I need a house. Uh, we're trying to make a decision and go before God. We need to know this or that. You know, how many times did I hear the invitation at the end of the service? You're free to go. You are dismissed. If you want to stay and gather around the altar, please do so. We'll be here probably another hour yet, and we'll be seeking God at the front. You can seek God quietly on your own, in your own devices. You can tell us your needs, and we can seek God openly with English or tongues. And you're welcome to stay in the church until God has heard you and heard your prayer and the miracles accomplished in your life. You know, they've departed from that. They've lost their first love. And, you know, the Methodists, the Baptists, a lot of what I said about the Lutherans and the Assembly of God applies as more, more or less, or, you know, as much. Methodists, you're likely nowadays to get somebody coming out of seminary who feels that, well, bless God, I, I worked, I did my part. Now I can sit on my ass the next 40 years and get paid, and I don't have to do nothing. No more studying. No more hard this or that. I'm just going to have my little programs, my little 10-minute New Age sermon on Sunday, and la, 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 everything is good and sunshiny and love and kisses. You know, and uh, uh, I heard some of the stuff that makes my flesh crawl from mainline denominational pulpits, just horrible. And the Baptists, well, their, their area where they chop out Bible passages, chapters, and books, is uh, largely around uh, miracles and, uh, you know, believing in the supernatural and uh, answers to prayer. And the Baptists are real hard on the Assembly of God and the Pentecostals, and the Pentecostals are pretty hard on the Baptists. And the Lutherans and the Episcopals and the Methodists, just they don't have Baptists or Assemblies of God churches in their towns, so <laughs> they ignore them. <laughs> I mean, growing up, in the town of Nazareth, Pennsylvania, as a, as a child of a pastor of a church of 2,500 members, uh, I didn't even know there was such a thing as an Assembly of God church or a Baptist church. I never heard of them. When I grew up in that little town, our world of Christian denominational religions was the Reformed Church across the street, which is, I, I believe, came out of Holland, you know, the Netherlands, the Reformed Dutch Church, and then the Lutheran Church, and both of the multi-million dollar large physical facilities on acres. And, and then you had uh, the Moravian Church in the center of town. They had a big church, too. And there was the Catholic Church. That was it, brother. I mean, if you wanted to go to church and praise God on a Sunday morning, you had your pick. Are you Lutheran? Are you Reformed? Are you a Moravian or are you a Catholic? And uh, actually, the Methodists and the the Reforms and the Lutherans made out like they were so different, and like they were a lot different from each other. You know, they were the same thing. You uh, you walk into a Methodist church or a, a Reformed church or a Lutheran church, you can't tell the difference between who's who. Now, the Catholics were a little different. They had Jesus still crucified hanging on the cross and the statues of Mary sitting around and rosary beads and confessions to, to the priests and things like that. But, uh, you know, uh, the Lutheran wardrobe that the pastors wore gives the Catholic uh, wardrobes a run for their money and their ornateness of the churches, etc. So, you know, just some of the denominations that, in their own way, to a degree, deny the New Testament as the untainted true word of the living God. And there are variations in each denomination. Some church pastors waver more or less from official doctrines 
of their church fathers and adopted doctrines of faith. That is, just because a Lutheran believes one thing in one town, another Lutheran pastor in another town may be preaching very differently, you know. Whereas one guy may be classical and traditional, and it's the pipe organ and the choirs. The other guy, another Lutheran pastor in another town, will have the little Christian rock band and the guitars or brass instruments and pianos, and it will be upbeat services. And uh, so, you know, the, the uh, Baptists, if you know about the Baptist church, their conventions are famous for having fistfights on the convention floors between the pastors. The pastors that come to the annual conventions for the Baptist church to discuss issues of doctrine and, and business for the Baptist church get into loud, vociferous fights among themselves. So just because you're in a denomination doesn't mean they all even believe alike and interpret the Bible the same way. And then, you know, the faith movement came into play 40 years ago, uh, longer than that ago, but it really didn't become known in the United States till like 1980 and beyond. Kenneth E. Hagin started a whole anti-movement uh, against uh, the traditional ways of, of looking at the Bible. He was very much against, he included, as in my opinion, Kenneth E. Hagin included all the verses of the New Testament. He was open. If he gave a paragraph of teaching, he would give a verse to back up what he just taught. And uh, the faith movement... Uh, there was a whole anti-movement against the faith teaching of the New Testament. And there was a whole uh, bunch of stuff coming out of the assemblies. They couldn't handle that God is a good God. He never says no. Nothing is impossible to them who believe. And Jesus said nothing is impossible to those who believe. Nothing is impossible with God. That was Jesus, the word of God himself, who said that. So how are you going to argue with that? You know, yet, you know, nothing is impossible with God. That's Luke chapter 1. And Jesus in the Gospels said nothing is impossible to those who believe. Faithless, weak pastors, unable to bring about anything as possible miracles to their parishioners, rather than to say, my faith is just not there. I'm as the apostles were. I lack the strength of faith to do the commands of Jesus and bring about the miracles and the gifts of the Spirit that you're needing, rather chose to blame God, blaspheme God, and defame his name. Uh, you know, they're not blaming themselves. They're not taking responsibility for the needs of the Christians going unmet by faithless prayers and religious rituals, which were pro forma Christian, but in fact lack the power of the Word of God and the Spirit of God as found in the New Testament from the mouth of Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul. That is, rather than say, I don't have the faith to believe for a miracle for you, brother. Instead, they say, it's not God's will to heal you, provide for you. God is teaching you something. Or worse yet, God says, no, it's not God's will to meet the need of yours. Or, may, or maybe God has said, maybe you're wait. Or God is thinking it over. Or there's more opportune time coming. <clears throat> well, my Bible in Philippians 4, verse 19 says, My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And all he needs is the Christian. You alone are standing with your Christian senior pastor to agree and stand on this verse of the Bible rather than wimp out and blame God for not getting what somebody needs. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. That is a mouthful. That is a defined, black and white, easy to understand sentence. And yet there are so many buts attached to that verse by well-meaning pastors in their denominations. And buts are there to make an ass of the people saying them. Buts are excuses to remove the pastors from blame 
for prayer failure. But take church pastors out of the ring of culpability and place them into the helpless sidelined viewing bleachers where God is in total and full sovereign control of everything and we are merely helpless puppets watching and spectating from the sidelines unable to affect real difference or real change and in such apostate unbelieving settings as that rational rational church members in the pews ask themselves and why am I wasting my time praying to a God who's in full control and will do what he wants to anyway and nothing I do or say matters anyway if there's no miracles today if prayer doesn't avail anything if we're just going through a ritual why am I sitting here wasting my time great question because the Bible in no way shape or form says that prayer is futile, useless, or an exercise in mere religious format. The prayer of a faithful man avails much. Not little, much. The prayer of a faithful man avails much. James 5.16 You might say, Dave, the verse says the prayer of a righteous man avails much, is the correct scripture. And God said to Abraham that his faith was imputed to him as righteousness, and the righteous are saved by faith through grace. Therefore, it is impossible to please God without faith, as it says in Hebrew, Hebrews. As faith is righteousness to God the Father, elsewise you're judged by your works. And all have failed and come short of the glory of God and sinned unto death by mere works alone. Therefore, let your righteousness be by your faith, not by your works, lest you die in judgment over your sins by a holy God in whom no man, before whom no man is guiltless by his mere works alone. And all the women out there said, Amen, brother. <laughs> now you know that I'm saying in Christ there is no male or female. When I'm saying man, I'm including the women in what I'm saying. Only Jesus Christ worked and achieved sinlessness on this mortal walk on earth. Only he was and is righteous by his works forever. We are righteous by his work forever. Only by our faith in him through the grace of God that on purpose it might not be by works but by faith. God having bound all men over to sin that there would be no more Lucifers. Men with pride who stand on their own supposed merits, goodness, holiness, and righteousness without need of faith or grace from God. And you know, Romans is great in discussing that whole doctrinal area. I, I uh, ask you to read the book of Romans if you haven't lately. God has bound all men over to sin so that there would be salvation by grace through faith, not of works. As such, as your pastors present themselves to you weekly on Sunday mornings as righteous men by their works and say that they walk holy, sanctified lives before the Almighty God. Yes, brother, I was a sinner saved by grace and now through the continual sanctification and purification by the word of the living God, I walk before you a holy man. I can't remember the last time I actually sinned before God <laughs> and that right there is a sin and making that kind of a statement for a group of people or Christians that's a sin it's a sin of pride and you're lying <laughs> <clears throat> apart from the faith and the grace of the blood of Jesus Christ you are apostate unbelievers in the word of God and are leading and being led in a cult of misinformation and lies Beware of any man who presents to you that they are holy and sanctified in their walk before God in and of themselves, apart from the Holy Spirit of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. Pure grace, faith, not works. Our good works only naturally develop from our faith and from our relationship with God. We dwell in the vine. The vine causes us, the branches of the vine, 
to bear fruit. The branches never bear fruit without benefit of the vine, who is Jesus Christ. Mark any pastor who stands on any stage of any church platform who appears to be saying he is bearing fruit apart from the vine of Jesus Christ in and of his own conscious will, bearing fruit in and of his own will, his mental determination, his holiness and self-righteousness, his willpower, and his own labor and work. Such a man has fallen from the grace of God. Let no man say he is or walks holy before our living God, our Heavenly Father, save from purely the grace and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that comes upon the Christian at the new birth. That is a man who says he has been crucified or has been sanctified by grace in the beginning of his walk with God and has by the Spirit of God, by his personal growth and power, reached a point wherein he no longer sins but keeps himself and does walk holy before a holy God, no longer needing pure grace from the blood of Jesus. From any such man, stay away. Don't listen to them. They have left the Christian faith. They are apostate and they are fallen from grace. To the point wherein any man of God in his teaching of the faith to the body departs from, denies, and changes the New Testament, denies the Old Testament, says the Old Testament's a dead thing, man has departed from, denied, and corrupted the living word of God and is leading men in that degree to error, apostasy, and eternal damnation. The New Testament is a challenge and a hard thing to men of pride, to men of works, to men of ego, to men of self-esteem, to the brass plaque lovers, the ones whose names are on the brass plaques in your local church. Having started from grace, being saved by the work of Jesus Christ, they attempt to continue on independently of Jesus Christ and his blood and to enter into the sin of the devil the sin of pride and arrogance and attempting to place their work on the altar of God Almighty as good enough, worthy alone of their entrance into the kingdom of heaven. They do this by denying, changing, and departing from the New Testament, which is the written incarnation of Jesus Christ, the living word of God, and veering off into their own teachings in order to justify their faithless, infinite, lives. Have I arrived? Has Dave Long gotten there? Can I, as a man of faith in Jesus Christ, pray every time in faith and declare the word of God unto the devil and the world and before the holy throne of God and see miraculous results all the time? I, I wish I could say yes. I have to say no. I see as through a glass darkly in part. I have not arrived. I'm not yet able to walk as Jesus Christ did and heal everyone, walk on water, calm the oceans, walk through walls, and stupefy the Pharisees with perfect heavenly logic in their arguments. But I strive, as Paul the Apostle did, to attain to the high calling in Christ Jesus, of walking as Jesus did and doing his works, and I buffet my mind with the word of God as to the declarations of John chapter 17. I meditate on the fact that I am one with God in Christ, Jesus living within me and I living within him, one with him seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty even now as I type this according to Ephesians chapter 1 as written by the Apostle Paul in attempting to get this over to the Ephesians. And so, the modern church of Jesus Christ does its best to separate themselves from Jesus, even though Paul said we are the body of Christ on earth, in a literal meaning. Our hands are his hands, our feet are his feet. That is why Paul cautioned men not to join themselves to a prostitute, for he says in doing so, in dating a whore, you've joined Jesus himself bodily, to the horror of the prostitute. But we are the real 
literal living temples of God, of the Holy Spirit of God. Wow, that's, that's a sobering thought. And as you can see, we, we've got another three pages to go there. We're covering over this pretty well, pretty fast. This is page 7 out of 10. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you want to pause and take a pee break, <laughs> get some coffee or warm something up, that would be great. Because I, I know sitting and listening, uh, you get a little richy, especially when there's no visual aids to it. And uh, I apologize for not having lighting technicians and makeup and hairstylists and and a, a really nice expensive set for you to watch so you can watch me as I talk to you. It's bad enough to watch a guy on a stage or from a pulpit talking to you dryly for an hour or two, but to 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 just have to be able to read the words, you know, you start veering off to other sites and playing tic-tac-toe. <laughs> Anyway, as walking in faith with God inside of us and commanded to imitate him in his faith and works of the gifts of the Spirit, one with him, indwelling the vine, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, by meditating on the word of God, which is him, who is the word of God, that is reading and studying the Bible, getting it into our hearts, getting it into our spirit, we are capable of bearing fruit by manifested works of the gifts of the Spirit. And Paul, even Paul said, you know, the greatest theologian ever lived, arguably, besides Jesus. You know, Paul the Apostle said, I come to you not with the excellent words of a man and the excellent logical reasonings. I come to you in the demonstration of power of the gifts of the Spirit. So, come on, churches, stop using that feeble excuse. Well, brother, you know, the Bible says, and Paul said that, that if I don't have love, I'm nothing, and the gifts of the Spirit don't mean anything. All God cares about is the fruits of the Spirit. Well, you know, you tell that to Jesus Christ when you get to heaven. And he said, you know, People would have listened to what you would have said if you were demonstrating the power of God and miracles to them. They would have given some kind of validation to your words. But those people just blew you off. You were just another voice in a loud vocal world with many voices. And those people are in hell today burning forever because you refused to get it real with the Holy Spirit of God and seek his face and spend time with him so that he'd rub off on you and you would have faith to raise the dead and heal the sick. So, hearing the word of God is the way that we build our faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. If you're not meditating on the words of the Bible, you're not building your faith. You're not eating his flesh. You're not drinking his blood. So, given the word of God and the proclamation of the command that we call the Great Commission, we are, as a body, commanded to go preach the good news to all the world, healing the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out the demons. To the extent any man or denomination denies the Great Commission from the lips of Jesus Christ himself, who never changes, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care if you're the senior pastor or the janitor in the church who swabs out the toilets, but commands not one here or there, but everyone, everywhere, who is in the faith of Christianity, to the extent anyone or anything denies the healing of the sick, raising of the dead, cleansing lepers, casting out demons, they have denied the faith. They're in apostasy. They have left the faith and the word of God, if that were possible, and have fallen from grace and are a cult of Christianity, not a real Christian. Not a Christian in fact. So at least the attempt must be made to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse and cast out the demons. The prayers must be offered. Any man refusing to hear nothing is impossible with God, and 
all things are possible with God. Nothing is impossible to those who believe. That man has left the faith and is, in fact, part of the cult of Christianity, not a true Christian. Therefore, I mock and turn my gaze on the multitudes of institutions of religion who are supposedly Christian, who say they believe and teach the faith, who along with the 2,999 other Christian denominations say that they have the light and the way, I say to the extent you have left the Word and the New Testament and preach excuses of man and traditions of man for denying and changing what is written there, you make allowance for your own lack of faith, that is, excuses for why you don't believe what's in there, you, my friend, are in fact a cult. You are not of the Christian faith. Oh, if we could only get Christian pastors of the church to read and study the Bible. Say, Dave, boy, Dave, that's a weird thing to say. What? What did you just say? Oh, if we could only get the senior pastors of your church to read the Bible and to study the Bible, especially the New Testament, a lot would begin to change on planet Earth. Miracles would happen. There would be more unity in the body. Well, Dave, you know, when they went to denominational seminaries or to, you know, the non-denoms Bible colleges for four whole years, they took apart the Bible and went over everything that's in there in depth. <laughs> really? You think so? You think, you ask a lawyer who goes to law school for three years, how much they know about the laws of their state. There's 80 volumes of laws for the state of Pennsylvania, not to mention federal laws, not to mention local laws, township laws, county laws, your your local association rules of covenant of laws, you know, your personal laws, your family laws, the laws and rules you personally apply to yourself that you abide by. You know, in the three years that lawyers study law, they'll be the first ones to tell you, no, we didn't go over all the laws and learn what the laws of the land are. They just showed us where to look for them. They gave us practice and the very basics. When we get out of law school, that's ground zero and where we start learning about the laws. We buy the, the volumes and, you know, our libraries and our in their law offices are packed because there's that many laws. And uh, now as a Bible, God has made it easy because he's just got the Old Testament, the New Testament. And you would think that you could get a senior pastor to read over, look and examine and meditate on that one book. And uh, <clears throat> But as somebody who went to a Christian Bible college, which is in the Pentecostal faiths, the equivalent of mainline denominational seminaries. Uh, it's four years long. And it's, you know what? Uh, if you get a year of Hebrew and a year of Greek and you get a year of psychology and a year of sociology and a year of marriage and family and a year of they, they throw in math and science and they throw in a whole lot of stuff. You know, in the freshman year at a Bible college, you know, they cover the Old Testament and the New Testament in one semester. You know, here's, here's the Old Testament survey, here's the New Testament survey. And <clears throat> you're supposed to go home and read the, the Bible, the books of the Old and the New Testament as they go through the survey. And believe me, when you cover the Old Testament in one semester, you are booking. You're not having any time to th consider what's on that page and what's happening. You basically spit back in class the rough highlights of what's going on in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There is no in-depth study of the books. Okay, they had a class in Hebrews. They had a class in Synoptic Gospels. They had a class in, uh, you know, you, you, you could uh, get books that did cover for uh, Daniel and Revelation as one class for a semester. But still, 
in the how many hours a week? Three, three to five hours of lecture a week that a professor has to prevent, present his ideas for 15 weeks, three hours a week for 15 weeks. You're, you're really lucky if you get any in-depth stuff there. And most people are just looking at, you know, when you're in seminary or Bible college, you're just looking at the grades. Well, let's see, what, what do I have to remember for the grade? What do I have to spit back for the exams and the tests to get me through this? Keep my 4-0 so, you know, mommy and daddy will be happy I made the dean's list. And when I get out of here, bang, I'll have my diploma, my sheepskin, my little certificate. It says I'm a real pastor. And, oh, you've, you've just begun there. You, uh, if you're not a lifelong studier, uh, God help you. Uh, because what you learned in seminary or Bible college, go ahead, speak a couple of sentences to me in, in Greek. I dare you. <laughs> you had your year of Greek. I, I went uh, in high school. I had three years of Latin. I had three years of German in high school. And then I had another year of German in college. I had a year of Russian in college. I can't, I can't tell you, I can't speak even close to fluently in Latin or Greek or German. And uh, forget about Russian, <laughs> you know, just, just one year of Russian, no way. So I'm telling you, please don't be impressed by somebody who's got a degree because they went through seminary. They basically gave those people and individuals the tools to figure out where to go to find out the answers. They did not give them the answers. They did not give them the doctrines of the Bible. There's a, there's a book called Systematic Theology. And uh, Systematic Theology books, uh, there are several different good authors of such type books, which arrange the teachings of the Bible by the type of teaching. You know, what, what is the doctrine involved here, and how can you back it up with the Word of God? and uh, excellent books. Uh, really, you have to have that if you're a preaching pastor. If you're uh, teaching the Bible, you have to have a systematic theology. And it's a big, thick book. It's much bigger, much thicker, much longer than the Bible is. But uh, they're, they're very enjoyable. They're excellent. And you know, they're not perfect. You, you, each pastor is responsible for going through the passages that they're basing things on and, uh, you know, doing their own uh, tweaks if they see problems here or there. But what I'm saying is, if we could only get Christian pastors of the church to read and study the Bible, stop reading books about the Bible. There's enough depth in the Bible that you can take sometimes one verse and sit on it for a day and just keep chewing on it and thinking about it and go into the Greek and the Hebrew for it and find out their meaning. So the words that gave rise to that verse. Stop reading human psychology, the Reader's Digest, philosophy of men. Read the New Testament. Don't go through five chapters of the Bible a day. Read and meditate on and understand and think about a portion of the Bible daily if possible. If you read and meditate on one verse of the Bible and it's a life-changing verse and you look up the original Greek for the verse and come to an understanding and a faith in that verse, you have done well for the day. Philippians 4.19 is one such great verse. I also love the chapter of John, chapter 17. But Philippians 4.19 is a great verse. It is an enabling, encompassing verse of the New Testament that is a blank check to believers and Christians everywhere. If you have faith to receive it, go ahead. Great is the temptation to limit that verse, to make excuses for God, to make excuses for our lack of our faith. Great is the temptation to limit the verse, to make excuses for Philippians 4.19 and for our lack of faith in Philippians 4.19. But I challenge you to embrace it. Eat his flesh. Drink his blood. Dwell in the vine of Jesus Christ. The word of God. After all, Jesus is the incarnate 
inbreathed version of the Word of God, the second being in the Trinity, in whom we live and breathe and have our being. You were created. Your spirit came from him. In him we live and breathe and have our being. There are many, many astounding, miraculous promises in the Bible. Please do no violence to the Word of God by passing them over and disregarding them and taking them as if you were reading metaphors, similes, Shakespeare, classic literature. Other books are fantasies. This book, the Word of God, is reality. It is truth. It is the seed bag of faith given to us from the Holy Spirit of God. It is the answer to your prayers. It is the foundation of our faith and of our one true religion, Christianity. <clears throat> this teaching will be continued, no doubt. Much like certain rich sections of the Bible, I will come back to this kind of teaching again. Consider this meditation of the Word of God as part one. Thanks for stopping by and listening to us today on The Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long on the YouTube channel. And now for your benefit, here's an email contact address. I've been thinking about giving out my phone number. Going back and forth on this, I think what I'll do is if you contact me by email, just about everybody has email nowadays. If you contact me by this email address and you have a situation or emergency, I will try to get back to you by email or if you give me your phone number by phone. And uh, I'd be more than happy and willing to apply my faith to your needs and go before the throne of God in petition prayer. Email me uh, contact me uh, initially by email address and uh, we'll, you know we'll see what you're wanting or needing and uh, I will give out my phone number to you and once again the email address that we're using today is tattoo pierced at live.com now this is tricky because usually you spell tattoo with two T's and if you spell tattoo with two T's put in tattoo pierced at live.com you're not going to get me because I have one T and I did that for a purpose originally uh, so that I would get the people I want to to email me and the people who are not distinguishing the letters that I'm giving them anyway tattoo pierced you know Dave how did you pick tattoo pierced well Jesus was pierced for our iniquities pierced for our sins the nails that applied him to the cross pierced him. And now we're alive. And he's alive. It's pierced at live.com. And the tattoo, you know, the Old Testament says that our names and we are tattooed to the hands of God, our Heavenly Father. He cannot forget us. We are there to remind him of our presence daily. We are tattooed in his heart. And on his body, tattooed with our names, pierced for our sins. And, uh, you know, it it just fits well. And my other email uh, is kind of like that along those lines. I have a more famous email address, but it's used secularly for comedy and for uh, business purposes. So I won't be giving that one out. Uh, today, but if you have a current emergency or need in your life, I invite you to email me at tattoo pierced at live dot com. And tattoo pierced is spelled T A T O O P, as in Paul I E R C E D. <clears throat> ready to pray with you personally seven days a week excluding the hours usually I'm not going to be reachable for one reason or another from 10 o'clock at night till 8 o'clock in the morning um, very unlikely I'll check my email after 10 o'clock at night or before 8 o'clock in the morning and uh, I apologize if we're not quick on getting back to you on this 
But uh, unlike a lot of other ministries that make me cringe, I'm not here to take your offering and then send you out the door so I can go eat my pizza and give you some kind of little flowery religious one minute feel good prayer which exhorts you to be loving kind and you know and decent and forgive <laughs> we're, we're going to have a whole sermon on forgiveness soon because that that uh, doctrine has been abused badly by the impotent uh, pastors and uh, and especially by the ones that are new agers and uh, forgiveness you know that Jesus never forgave Judas if Jesus Christ had forgiven Judas Jesus, Judas Iscariot would have gone to heaven not hell but we know because the Bible says so he was lost he wasn't saved he was lost and it would have been better for Judas if Judas had never been born Jesus Christ did not forgive Judas Iscariot for his sins. In the New Testament, uh, when uh, Peter confronted Ananias and Sapphira, the Holy Spirit of God and Peter did not forgive Ananias and Sapphira of their sins before God, of lying uh, to the Holy Spirit and before the body of Christ and for taking glory that belonged to God for themselves they were not forgiven if they had been forgiven by Peter and the Holy Spirit they wouldn't have collapsed and died on the spot when they lied before man or God well that's the New Testament Dave oops <laughs> yeah that's right that said uh, Jesus did not forgive Judas uh, Peter did not forgive Ananias and Sapphira in the Old Testament you've got uh, David King David did he forgive the Philistines who came and raided his home at Ziklag and took away their families and wives and their goods and materials? No. David didn't, you know, if David would have run in today's typical uh, non-denom or assembly of God Christian, David today would hear these words. Well, brother, you know, the Bible says just you know, move on and uh, forgive and forget. And bless them. God will take care of you. <laughs> bless them who have raided and seized everything you have and own and, and taken your horses and your wives and your children and your money and your gold and everything. Oh, well, just trust God and move on and build another house. <laughs> David didn't do that. He went before God and said, what should I do? God said to him, pursue, overtake, destroy. Go after the Philistines, you will catch them. The raiders of Ziklag. Over, pursue them, overtake them, recover everything that you lost. Take back, seize back, by warfare, by fighting them. The, the wives that they took, the goods that they took, the cars that they took, the money that they took. Punish them. And I imagine David and his men killed them. I imagine these men were slain. David did not forgive the robbers of Ziklag. So that those uh, few little, there's three Bible quotation areas. I can give you more about it's not true that no matter how heinous the people around you are acting, that you have to forgive them. You know, it depends. Did they know what they were doing? Were they in ignorance or known sin? And also, uh, was it a big deal? And have they repented? Have they come before you and asked you to forgive them? Have they been in tr really, truly repentant and remorseful for what they did and acknowledge, you know what, what I did there? That was not Christian. It was not of God. I shouldn't have done that. And I just ask for your mercy and forgiveness. Please forgive me. You know what, when somebody does that to you, you, you don't have a choice. But if they're going to be repentant to you about something evil they did against you, they are also going to restore. They are going to do some material act of restoration for the wrong that they have done against you. So, uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, I'll be periodically checking emails uh, when I'm able or not out of town. And uh, I will re 
return your emails if you prefer to keep it on the internet and or give you a call if you give me your phone number and we can go straight before God and petition, petition him. And you know the Bible says if two or more agree together as touching anything, they have what their petition is of God the Father Almighty. But today my rant, my sermon, my meditation has largely been wrapped around uh, wrapped around the modern apostate church uh, that calls themselves Christian church followers and representatives of Jesus Christ. So 14 hours a day of personal ministry by email or phone, leave a message, help I need, supernatural help from Jesus. And uh, we'll try to be there to help you out in your times of need. I do not turn my back on people. Even if I am only time-wise able to give you a sentence or two, and if I can pray with you, I'd, I'd be pleased to see God move in your behalf. And uh, so until next time, this is Dave Long for the Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long on YouTube channel saying uh, God bless and the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.